Good. All right. Hello, pill poppers. We're bringing you a special edition, a micro dose. It's me, Victor, the formerly known as the politics guy, but maybe that's not an appropriate title anymore since really we have two politics guys in a sense. And I have the other one with me, Matt McManus. What's up? We wanted to, today we wanted to focus on someone who is probably not considered to be traditionally in the critical theory tradition. And I would say probably people who are informed by the critical theory tradition generally uh, are perhaps critical of him, Rawls, of course. And we sort of want to talk today about why we think he's an important figure to consider if you're, if you're interested in radical politics, uh, why he has more critical potential than maybe he's given credit for, and sort of why we think some of the critiques of his might be a little bit unfair. Um, so I'd like to begin by asking you, Matt, because um, I know that a lot of your work is pretty influenced by Rawls, and um, I, I myself am pretty influenced by Rawls, even though I come at things from a more continental perspective. But uh, you have a book coming out, and uh, which is definitely influenced by Rawls, so maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so the book that's coming out is Liberalism and Liberal Rights, a Critical Legal Argument uh, with Hal Gray McMillan. Uh, you wrote the introduction for it also. So, yes, uh, It's not exclusively a single author project. Um, <laughs> now we got uh, a Hail Mary okay. assist on that one. All right, so before diving too deeply into uh, Rawls's thought, I want to just offer some context, so maybe Matt... How would you situate uh, what Rawls is doing with relation to what you how you what you understand liberalism to be broadly, and in what way is he a liberal? A liberal? Well, Rawls's relationship to liberalism changes significantly over the course uh, of his academic career. Right, uh, early in his career, he tends to frame himself as a kind of Kantian liberal who is emphasizing um, both the importance of individual autonomy, uh, but also you know the relevance of looking at moral issues from a relatively abstracted or impartial standpoint, right? Right. But giving it a bit more of an empirical twist. Um, later on, when he talks about political liberalism, what he means is that the principles that govern society have to be endorsed by people who hold a wide variety of different metaphysical views. Uh, and that includes Kantians, uh, but also can include people from re different religious backgrounds, atheists, Marxists, you name it. Uh, pretty much anybody who doesn't hold what he characterizes uh, as a fundamentally unreasonable viewpoint. Um, Right. But I guess just like at a more basic level, though, would you say like, so he's a liberal because would you say he emphasizes like the individual or um, I don't know, like how would you define if you were just defining like liberalism in a basic way? Yeah. Like and how he is one. I, I think the reason that Rawls actually can be characterized as a liberal, if you're talking about it from a very principled perspective, is that at the epicenter of his work is the notion that all people are fundamentally moral equals. Right. Uh, and they're right, entitled, okay. entitled on that basis to equal respect. Uh, and the problem with our society as it exists right now is the fact that our society doesn't treat people as moral equals. Uh, we still tend to evaluate individuals uh, from this very meritocratic standpoint uh, and suggest that certain people deserve where they wind up being uh, because they either lack certain natural talents or they lack certain attributes of character. Uh, and Rawls is going to resist this right. very strongly. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that he believes that everyone should be equal in fact. And this is one of the things that the difference principle tries to capture. Uh, but it does mean right. that we should operate from the presumption that equality is the best thing to achieve and any deviations from it need to be justified uh, rather than just taken as being natural or inevitable. Right. Doesn't he, doesn't he, he prioritizes the right over the good, right? Meaning, I guess, which, like, how would you define that? Well, well that's a complicated question, right? Uh, but it does relate back to the issue of moral equality because fundamentally what he's saying is that all people being moral equal doesn't necessarily mean that each person is going to do live as fruitful or flourishing a life, right? Uh, and that's because moral equals might decide that they're going to engage in very different life plans uh, or aspire to very different life goals, some of which may be more worthy of our veneration than others, right? Um, right. So, for example, somebody who decides to spend their life... Counting, is it, is it like counting... Counting like the, the like the blades of grass was that an example? Yeah, exactly. Of his book? You know, somebody who sits there and has this idiosyncratic uh, desire to count all the grains of sand in a beach, uh, or every grain of uh, yeah. uh, like every blade of grass in a field. Blade of grass. Uh, that might be a life plan of some sort, and you know, all power to you. But we would hardly call them as worthy of reverence um, or you know respect uh, as somebody who sat there and produced great works of poetry or produced um, you know, penicillin or whatever it happens to be, right? Uh, but by his, his argument for the priority of the right over the good is that it's not the state's job to try to arbitrate between these life plans uh, and suggest that 
we endorse one of them over the other. Um, and the reason for this is because Rawls thinks that the kind of experimentalism that's shown when people are free to decide what they think is worthy of veneration uh, and pursue that without interference allows a variety of different viewpoints to emerge, and we all benefit from that, right? And then to some extent, this is key. This is key to the answer to the question of what makes him a liberal, right? Because like that's a very liberal move to make, to prioritize the right over the good, in a way. Absolutely, and I think that uh, you can see this reference um, – in John Stuart Mills, right? Uh, the notion that experiments and living, as Mills puts it, uh, are beneficial not just to the individuals who are engaging in the experiment, but to all of us because we can all draw, if you want to put it, uh, on the data uh, that they accrue over the course of their life, right? Uh, and that doesn't mean that yeah. everybody who engages in, uh, in an experiment in living is going to wind up successful, right? Uh, some people might realize that the kind of experiment that they undertook was actually really misinformed uh, or probably not the most advisable thing to do. Uh, but then we learn from that as well. Right. Exactly. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's key to to understanding what makes him a liberal. Right. He wants to set those questions of like what a good life is, like how do we morally evaluate like and an kind of uh, rank different quote, like kinds of life. We have to set that question aside. In some ways, he wants to say they're not relevant to um, how we're going to design a just regime. And we have to just think about prioritizing, like giving people the equal opportunity to do things. And I think that's a good way. And then one more, one more thing just to like get out of the way before we get into the nitty gritty is just, there's obviously this idea of the original position right. and the veil of ignorance. And I feel like maybe we should just explain that maybe people who are familiar with Rawls took an undergrad course, probably know about what that is, but it's probably important just to give a very basic understanding of what, what we mean by the veil of ignorance or the original position. Sure. Of course. Uh, so Rawls's notion of the original position is an effort to try to capture the essence of what he thought was insightful in the contractarian tradition. Right. Uh, and the original position is a situation where uh, reasonable self-interested actors are supposed to deliberate on the principles of justice that would organize society. Uh, and after they leave the original position, whatever principles they chosen will be the ones that uh, organize society and they'll have to live with their choice. OK, uh, the veil of yeah. ignorance is a restraint he puts on the capacity of these individuals to know who they're going to, to be uh, in a very concrete sense of the word. Uh, so Rawls says that the problem with the way that a lot of us reason morally uh, is that we're way, way, way too partial um, to trying to benefit ourselves uh, or trying to advance our own viewpoint uh, based on our history, our value system, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and this all precludes uh, making a more objective kind of judgment, right? Uh, and the argument yeah. that he makes is that, okay, so say we want to put people in this original position where they have to deliberate upon and choose the principles that are going to organize society. Uh, what we'd want them to know would be things like the basic principles of economics. We want them to be self-interested and know that they're self-interested. Uh, we want them to know certain important features about human psychology, uh, and we want them to know how to read and so on and so forth. Uh, but we wouldn't want them to necessarily know things like, am I a man or a woman? Or am I rich or poor? Am I gay or straight? Uh, the problem being that right. if they had access to this kind of information, it would be all too easy for them to try to hedge the system to their benefit uh, and try to create right. a society that would, for instance, privilege men uh, over women. Uh, or would privilege so the veil of ignorance is just is just the thing that is it's it's, a, it's the name he uses to to say that this is the restraint in on the knowledge that people have. Exactly, right? that's what the veil of ignorance part. Exactly, it's a constraint on the kind of information that's available to reasoners. Because Rawls feels that this will produce more impartial outcomes. Uh, and right. even though the people behind the veil of ignorance will be self-interested, because they don't know what who they're going to be once the veil is lifted, they'll be more capable of deliberating upon the principles of justice uh, without giving into their biases and prejudices. Sometimes I, sometimes I find it useful, like an analogy, to think about if you're splitting up a cake <laughs> and then it's like you know that you're not going to get to pick which piece – so that incentivizes you to split the cake cup as evenly as possible because you're not going to get to pick, right? I don't know if you know. There's like some – I've sometimes thought of that as an analogy if that makes sense. No, that's exactly right. I mean uh, Rawls sometimes appeals to this metaphor, right, by saying one way that oh, you can right. try to think about this is what's the proper way to cut a cake, right? Uh, and it would be very easy to sit there and say, well, uh, I'll just give myself the biggest slice and deny everyone else a piece of cake. Uh, but he says what happens if you have to give everyone else a slice first? Uh, and then you get the last piece. Uh, well, in that kind of circumstance, you'd probably be more inclined towards allocating people equal shares because uh, you want to make sure that since yours is the, la yours is the last piece that's going to be given, uh, you would have the same kind of slice as everyone else, right? Uh, 
Uh, of course. And of course, it gets much more complicated in a political society. But that analogy is kind of an idea, a way of knowing about the kind of work that that ignorance, because you're not going to know where you end up, is doing. It incentivizes you to try to think more fairly. Exactly. Right. Uh, and that's why Rawls like these kind of metaphors and thought experiments. Right. Uh, I mean, some people have criticized him for this by saying that, well, he's abstracting away from who human beings really are and what it is that they do. Um, but his point is that, well, listen, like to a certain extent, we obtain a certain moral clarity, uh, precisely when we dissociate from our concrete interest in this way and try to reason impartially about what would be the most just thing to do. Uh, and all too often, he says, we fail to do this precisely because we're so embedded uh, in whatever it is that we're doing that we only think of justice as being whatever is beneficial to us at any given moment. Uh, and for obvious reasons, that's not a particularly helpful way of approaching the subject matter. So they have to think to themselves, um, what would, uh, since, since I don't know what I'm going to be at, what if I end up being, you know, a low income black woman or, uh, or whatever other marginalized group, how would I want society to be set up? What would the rules be? And essentially it's from this thought experiment that Rawls argues he, he arrives at his principles of justice, which we're going to discuss further. But the reason why I take Rawls seriously is I think that Rawls captures something radical, uh, in the liberal tradition that isn't always acknowledged uh, by critical theorists. Uh, and this is the idea that moral equality is the central value uh, that different societies are supposed to try to respect. Uh, and his argument in some respects is that liberal societies have done a good job advancing uh, the principle of moral equality over authoritarian regimes in the past, whether you're talking right. about slave societies or feudal societies, but in some sense, they're handicapped by their exclusive focus uh, on justice from a formalistic perspective, rather than looking uh, at what's necessarily uh, to lead a good life. Right. Different resources, honors, uh, and so on. Uh, and we can get into the kind of details of his work, but where he's really innovative uh, is by attaching liberalism to an argument for redistributive justice, in particular by suggesting that people behind the, the veil of ignorance in the original position would select to redistribute goods uh, so that any inequalities would only be permissible if they were to the benefit of the least well off. Right. Uh, and there are several primary justifications he gives for this, some of which, you know, are stronger than others. The big argument that I think is really convincing uh, and really persuasive uh, is his kind of devastating hit against what's sometimes called the workman ideal, uh, which is very right. prominent in moralistic justifications for classical liberal capitalism or neoliberal capitalism in the contemporary time period. And this is the argument that people are entitled to what they have uh, under a market society because they've earned it uh, in some mysterious way, right? That it's a just dessert uh, for the reward or the effort they put into things uh, along with being talented and intelligent and so on. Uh, and Rawls' right. argument is that if you actually break down why it is that people earn whatever it is that they earn in a capitalist society, uh, whether you're talking about earning very little or earning a lot, uh, for the most part, it's for what he calls morally arbitrary reasons right? that have nothing to do with the choices that people make. And his critique is so devastating that he even goes on to say that you can apply this mode of reasoning when talking about the effort that people commit uh, to trying to become successful. Uh, and he points out, uh, drawing on a number of empirical studies that have been uh, backed up, that even if you look at effort and striving, a lot of that is determined by having fortunate family uh, and educational circumstances early on in life, not, not to mention having a substantial degree of natural talents, uh, not being disabled and so on. Uh, and these are all things for which we can uh, claim no credit. Um, right. And the argument when you take all this together uh, is that not only is the notion of earning or deserving something uh, in a capitalist society not a really uh, compelling moral argument, uh, it starts to look actually incoherent if you're talking about dessert uh, from any kind of conventional uh, moral standpoint. That says there's some association between who you are and what you do and your moral qualities and what you get. Yeah, that makes sense. I think um, what's uh, maybe I'll, I'll back up a little bit because I'm interested because I guess thinking about Rawls uh, as having critical potential, because I, I agree with everything you said. You said I think it's important. It's an important line of critique. It's a powerful line of critique. And especially since today in America, we still see these ridiculous arguments from the right who just talk about people need to make better choices or whatever. And like, you know, they, they, they don't uh, really acknowledge the unearned 
sort of positionality that people are in, whether it's a good positionality or a bad one, right? So they they always just talk about everything being choices. And I think Rawls does a good job of showing, of, of providing an argument for why, like that's doesn't really uh, doesn't really exactly make sense. And I think the way he does this, by the way, which is the thing I want to bring it back to, is right, like the original position, which I think most people probably know the basic argument. Mm -hmm. But I guess to me, it, 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 I sometimes have thought about this as a form of critique that might even be like a kind of eminent critique, right? Which is sort of a um, sort of a foundation, right, of critical theory, right? The idea being that uh, that if you want to measure it, you met, you you, ch you check a society and see how it's living up to its own standards. And I think to some extent, maybe like before Rawls, we talked about formal equality and you know legal equality. But I think what Rawls does a good job with with, with his device of the original position is to show why maybe society is not actually living up to those principles. And I think, I don't know, maybe, do you want to give a, 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 a quick like summary of what of, of how the original position works? Sure, and, and I would say I think that you're exactly right. Uh, and Rawls isn't subtle about this either, uh, I should say, right? Uh, particularly in the first edition of Theory of Justice, he situates himself in the broadly Kantian tradition, uh, which is obviously a critical condition uh, that suggests that we need to analyze not just our interpretation of the world, and our interpretation of what's right, but under what conditions we can say things are right or wrong in the first place. Uh, and when you start to do that, it beheads uh, a lot of the all ideological justifications for heteronomy or the status quo that the powerful like to invoke to try to justify their under privileges um, and resources, right? Yeah. Uh, but just putting it really briefly, right? Rawls's uh, thought experiment has been subjected to a huge number of different critiques and analysis. Um, we don't want to get into all that because you'd be here all mm. day. Um, but putting it really briefly, uh, he suggests that we should try to imagine what it would be like uh, if we had to actually formulate something that approximates a social contract, right? Uh, he says, if you think about the contractarian tradition uh, of Locke, Hobbes, and Rousseau, uh, it seems pretty obvious that there never was an actual state, uh, social contract where we move from the state of nature into living within civil society. It's not even clear, for that matter, that Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau ever say there was actually a social contract. But, you know, if you look historically, the closest thing that you can get uh, would be, for, for instance, something like the American founding, uh, where people did actually create a constitutional convention uh, and try to formulate what the principles organizing society was going to be. Uh, but of course, you know, the American social contract, and I put that in quotation marks, uh, mm -hmm. excluded women, the unpropertied, uh, African-Americans and people who are white. And so any kind of claim that, well, this is reflective of what everybody wants or would agree to, uh, even at the time, uh, is just bogus, right? And if that's your kind of exemplar of historical social contract taking place, uh, it's not a very good one, right? Yeah. Uh, so Rawls says, well, why don't we take this idea seriously then and say there never was a social contract historically, but what if there was one? You know, what would people choose uh, as the governing principles to organize society? He tries to stipulate certain conditions for the kind of reasoners who will be assessing what these principles are. And this is where the kind of Kantian elements of his argument comes in. Uh, because he says, look, you know, one of the problems with conventional social contract theory uh, is if we take people simply as they are, uh, most of us has vested interest. We reason about things ideologically. Uh, a lot of the times we don't actually think about the principles that we would hold to all that critically. Uh, and of course, you know, economic um, factors play a major role uh, in determining what we think happens to be right or wrong, since rich people tend to think that they've earned uh, their wealth in some way, shape or form. And they're not very prone to thinking about that all that critically, right? Uh, so he says, yeah. we need a more impartial set of reasoners to actually determine what the best principles were going to be. Uh, otherwise, the only contract that we're going to get is something of a mess. Uh, and it's not really clear why we should find it morally compelling. And the kind of weird but actually strangely intuitive uh, argument he makes is, well, let's imagine a series of reasoners who are knowledgeable uh, or rational in the sense of being aware of the basic laws of human psychology, being aware um, of a lot of the basic laws of economics, being self-interested, and that's quite important. Uh, so that and also can, also being aware of of, of um, the fact of pluralism, or maybe that's in political liberalism, but I think that's an important one too, right? Like the, the fact that people are different. Oh, absolutely right. Being aware that they hold uh, that different people hold different moral outlooks, uh, and they're going to be aware of all of these things. Uh, but the a veil of ignorance is going to descend. Uh, this is the other part of his thought experiment. And they're not going to know uh, who they'll wind up being from a more concrete perspective, right? Uh, so they'll know that they're self-interested beings, but they won't know if they're a self-interested rich person uh, or self-interested poor person. 
Uh, they'll be aware yeah. of the fact that there are pluralistic worldviews in society, but they won't know if they're a religious fundamentalist uh, or if they're an atheist uh, or if they're agnostic. They'll know that they are likely to inhabit one of two genders. Uh, and Rawls is a bit anachronistic here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but they won't be aware of whether or not they're a man or a woman uh, or straight or gay. Um, and I mean, now, of course, we could just plug in transgender as an option. It's, I think, going to give you a similar... Yeah. Like, it's not that much of an alteration to just include that also. <laughs> I, I don't think so. And I mean, the, the nice yeah. thing about the, the veil of ignorance, right, uh, is it's inclusive of all these kinds of differences and particularities. Uh, at exactly. Least in theory, exactly. Right? So he says, you know, once you put this veil of ignorance down, you have these people who are rational, they're knowledgeable, uh, they're self-interested, but they're not aware of the concrete specificities of who they happen to be. Uh, and his argument is that given these circumstances, these individuals will be able to make a more impartial uh choice about the kind of principles that they'll want to govern society. And right. they reason and deliberate amongst themselves, and they propose a variety of different alternatives for the kind of society uh, they might want to have. Uh, and a number of these Rawls excludes just offhand, uh, because he says it's pretty clear that the majority, uh, or even you know the vast majority of people, would reject them. Uh, and this includes living in a slave society, uh, living in a feudal aristocracy. Nobody would really want to live in those and then 21st century exactly. context, because uh, it's quite likely that they would wind up at the bottom rung of society, and a very few people would wind up at the top. And also, these societies don't happen to be particularly effective at producing wealth. Uh, so even if you do happen to wind up at the top, you're probably not going to be as well off uh, as you would be uh, living in a better right. organized society. And he also, of course, and he, of course, wouldn't want, uh, like, even today's society, right? I, sorry, like, to cut you off, but I'm just, I want to kind of emphasize, I think it's what makes the critique powerful, right? Like today, especially against these sort of conservatives that I was talking about, right? Who, uh, who make, who say, just make better choices. Like, I think from this perspective, right, they'd say they would have to ask themselves, oh, crap, if I had to make a choice, like right now, think about the life of like a poor black woman, right? Would I want to, this is uh, the rules to be what they are today, Right. And I think the self-interest would make them realize, well, no, because like it forces, I think it forces intuitions that you have to admit that certain things are like unearned choices. Oh. I just want to throw that in there to connect it back to the last thing we were talking about. A absolutely. Right. And one of the things that's unique about Rawls in this respect uh, is while he does give a straightforward moral argument um, for why it is that we don't want to live in a liberal capitalist society of the form we live in right now. Uh, it's the moral arbitrariness one that I mentioned before. We'll get into that. Uh, he also does make a self-interested argument uh, to that effect. Uh, where he says, you know, if you were an impartial person behind the veil of ignorance uh, and you were self-interested, but you didn't know who you were going to wind up being, uh, no sane individual in his mind would decide to gamble that they'll have a one in a hundred chance of winding up a millionaire uh, if they have a one in two chance working at McDonald's, right? Yeah, exactly. uh, and not being able to support their family. Um, and there are some people who try to push against this by suggesting, well, maybe people would gamble behind the veil of ignorance in the original position. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of good psychological evidence to support that, I should say, uh, since a lot of research into political psychology suggests that people are risk averse uh, rather than risk. -prone. Most people anyway. Yeah, it doesn't seem reasonable to, to suggest that. I agree. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, and this is all supportive of Rawls standpoint. But, you know, also a short, right. He goes through a number of different alternatives uh, for society. The one that he thinks is the most compelling competitor to, you know, uh, what he calls justice is fairness, which is his own preferred set of principles for uh, organizing society, uh, is utilitarianism, right? The doctrine that you try to maximize aggregate happiness. Um, and I don't think anybody really wants us to go through, like, all the objections he has to utilitarianism. Yeah, definitely not. Long story short, he doesn't think that uh, people would be willing to take the risk that they'd live in a utilitarian society since they might be, uh, end up being uh, on the chopping block uh, if losing happiness for them would be utility maximizing overall. It's putting it really simply. Uh, but he says, yeah. you know, impartial people would choose two principles uh, of justice uh, that I'm calling justice is fairness, right? Uh, the first one would that be that people have an equal scheme of basic liberties for all, uh, conducive with the same basic scheme uh, for everyone else. That's the first principle. Uh, and then the second principle would be uh, divided into two parts. That offices and positions would be open to all uh, under conditions of fair quality of opportunity. Uh, and then the really important one, which is that any socioeconomic inequalities in society uh, could only be justified if they were to the benefit uh, of the least well off, uh, which is probably actually not probably. It's by far the most controversial uh, element of yes. his thinking, because uh, this is the one that really has a strong egalitarian connotation. And it's actually probably the place where he gets attacked from both the left and the right. Oh, yeah. Because he's because he's allowing for inequalities. It's just that those inequalities have to benefit the worst off. Exactly. Uh, and. 
there are a lot of interpretations about what this would mean. Uh, you know, how, what does it mean to say that you know impartial people would choose to benefit the least well off first and foremost? Some libertarians, uh, bleeding heart libertarians, um, have said that well, maybe a genuinely capitalist society, uh, not a kind of weird uh, capitalist plutocracy like we live in right now, but a genuine capitalist society would benefit them more. Uh, but Rawls' own opinion, particularly near the end of his life when he published his book, Justice and Fairness, uh, was that actually even a welfare state um, wasn't sufficient to realize the principles of justice and fairness, because uh, a welfare state still allowed too much inequality. Uh, so that's a pretty radical argument, right, when you think that Sweden uh, isn't going far enough, right? Uh, and his yeah, ultimate exactly. argument is that, or his ultimate position seemed to be that we would need to redraw society uh, and push it towards either being what he called property-owning democracy um, or a liberal socialist society. Uh, and he never actually says which of these he prefers. Uh, but I think William. Before Edison, we get to the before right. we get to those, though, actually, I kind of want to, to flag something else, which is. Um, you know the, the 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 veil of ignorance as a as a critique or as a as a form of critique. I think it's important, like, because we're kind of coming at this from the, from a podcast that is largely like critical theory oriented, and also, you know, for those who don't know this divide in philosophy between analytic and continental philosophy, I don't want to get too into that. But I think to some extent, obviously, critical theory tends to be more continental, and I think uh, which emphasizes maybe. L less less of like a rational actor at the center of of like political theory and i think sometimes rawls gets accused because of his device of the original position as you know positing some kind of a rational agent or that human beings like people i think make a mistake of that like you know the parties the people behind the veil of ignorance are like these perfectly rational people but i just kind of wanted to flag and say you know like like sort of my read of, of the original position is that it's not so much that they're being rational but like if you if you deny like the, the validity of the of the original position, in a way, I think effectively what you're saying is that moral imagination is impossible. Because in my in my opinion, what the device is doing is it's forcing you to imagine what it would be like to live as somebody else. Right. And I think that like if if you can't do that, like if you're saying that that requires some magical rational agent, then like moral reasoning is impossible. And like, how can you even argue for like Marxism or whatever other like left wing position if you can't because I think our ultimately, I don't know if you'll agree or disagree with me, Matt, but ultimately I think like your moral uh, reasoning has to be or like your arguments for a different uh, state of affairs or a more just society need to be based or founded on like pointing to examples to where you can be like being that person would suck. It's unfair that that person is like that. And I guess I just want to like defend that like underneath it all is actually like in my opinion a quite simple moral intuition uh, that shouldn't be that controversial. But because of how formal it is. I think Rawls often gets accused from by continental philosophers of, oh, you like, you're an individualist, like you're a, you're a, um, you know, an atomist and you believe in some sort of rational actor. And I just kind of wanted to present why I think from a continental or critical theory perspective, that need not be how we read Rawls. I don't know if you want to say something about that. No, I, I think that's true, right? A lot of continental theorists have tended to find Rawls a difficult figure to kind of deal with. Uh, probably the most uh, obvious example would be someone like Slavoj Žižek who every now and then references Rawls in his book, but has never actually offered a very substantial rebuttal beyond suggesting that he thinks envy uh, is a kind of persistent feature of human psychology and you can't get rid of it uh, under the conditions of kind of Rawlsian, um, what he thinks is a Rawlsian social democracy, right? Uh, and again, I think right. he's wrong about that. But I, I should say, in line with the comment you make about an imminent critique, right? I think that there certainly is an element of Rawls that's suggesting that you have to kind of dissociate yourself from your own specific partiality to try to think from a more universalistic standpoint. Because uh, Rawls says, well, okay, let, let's take seriously the idea then that people are self-interested actors, uh, the way that many defenders uh, of the capitalist status quo say that we are, right? That we're in it for number one, first and foremost, right? Uh, Rawls says, you know, if you are genuinely an impartial, self-interested actor uh, behind this veil of ignorance and you didn't know who you were going to wind up being in society, uh, you, if you were a self-interested person, you would not want to live in the kind of society we live in right now, uh, because you'd wind up so likely to be at the bottom uh, rather than one of the few people who wind up at the top. Uh, so it just wouldn't be a sensible bet to make. Uh, and the kind of contention he makes is if you take this contractarian argument seriously, uh, which is that we want principles that would be acceptable to all uh, under rational conditions of fairness, uh, where you can deliberate and decide on principles and have to hold to them, then that's a serious knock against the argument for unbridled capitalism or even welfare state capitalism, right? Uh, on its own terms, since truly self-interested mm -hmm. people wouldn't choose that. 
if they were behind the veil of ignorance. Exactly. Uh, uh, and I think that's a pretty powerful objection, right? Uh, so I, I should just say that that's one of his main objections uh, to the argument for unbridled capitalism, right? That's not what right. um, people would choose behind the veil of ignorance if they were self-interested actors. Uh, and to be honest, I don't know anyone who's actually been able to offer a particularly compelling argument against it. Um, the only yeah. kind of argument uh, that sometimes works uh, is people who try to make an empirical claim, which is that, well, if we actually take the difference principle seriously and what we want is to benefit the least well off, um, maybe a capitalist society is what does that. But I think, you know, it's pretty clear that that's not true, right? That there's a lot more that we could be doing uh, for the poor than we're doing right now. You know, at best, you'd want a society that look at least at the very least, you'd want a society that looks a lot more like Sweden rather than the contemporary United States or even Canada, right? right. Uh, in terms of looking after the poor, uh, since it's much better off, uh, you're much better off being low income there uh, than you are in here. And actually, so so Rawls's two suggested regimes you mentioned before, right? Like the property owning democracy. And what was the other one again? I, liberal, I so forget this. liberal socialism. Liberal socialism, right? Like those. I don't know if we can get into like a little bit about those, but I think. You know, they they don't eliminate market exchange altogether, right? So there would still be some form of capitalism in in, in at least maybe the property owning democracy. I can't remember. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, this is contentious, right? Uh, because Rawls never elaborated at great depth um, about the specific institutions uh, that would be needed to realize his principles of justice, right? Uh, which a lot of people have criticized him for, and I think justifiably, right? Um, I have my own criticisms uh, of him. Uh, when sure. it comes to the problems with uh, when it comes to him undervaluing um, democracy, uh, particularly the workplace democracy, uh, as a precondition for maintaining uh, the principles of justice over the long run, right? Uh, particularly right. against reactionary <clears throat> backlash. Uh, but you know, long, long story short, what he seems to mean by a properly only democracy, and again, there's just a few comments on this uh, in Justice is Fairness, a restatement, his last book, uh, is that effectively, rather than the means of production being owned um, by private or corporate actors. They'd be managed democratically, right? Uh, and that doesn't mean there wouldn't be private property any longer, uh, since obviously people would have an entitlement to personal property. In fact, you know, he would say that we might even need to take that more seriously by saying that um, since many people don't have a great deal of personal property, like a home, uh, there'd be obligations to redistribute well so that they'd be entitled to a certain level of personal property. Uh, that's a necessary precondition for them having self-respect. Right. No, that makes sense. Actually, I'll, I'll just I'll add a little uh, like addition just to, to sort of plug for my own uh, dissertation supervisor, Peggy Cohen. Her book is actually about um, uh, property, uh, specifically like real estate and, and housing and stuff like that. And she sort of makes this argument that um, that when you live in a city right now, we kind of assume that when you own own a house, like you own it, so you have the right to that property. But I think the, the argument she makes is like, but what made that house valuable was all the other people around it. Right. Like the fact that the city is vibrant and that people move in next to it. And she sort of argues that that doesn't mean obviously you take the property away, but it means that everybody sort of should have some sort of benefit from the property values going. It shouldn't only be the property owner since it's not like they're responsible for that property value going up. So I don't know. There seems to be some similarity there. Oh, I absolutely think so. Right. And this is one of the things Rawls draws our attention to again and again, uh, which is that oftentimes fortune or misfortune owes a tremendous amount uh, to factors that are well beyond our control uh, and are morally exactly. arbitrary, right? Which uh, we'll come back to later on because I want to kind of hit this point over the head a little bit. Um, okay. But I mean, he's he's absolutely uh, insistent uh, on kind of knocking down the egoistic conceit that everyone's in control of their own destiny uh, in a free and equal marketplace and they rise and they fall on their own merits, right? Uh, Rawls thinks that that's a myth and an extraordinarily harmful myth, uh, whether you're talking exactly. about people who feel that their homes have a certain intrinsic value to them. Uh, regardless of what's going on in the rest of the world, uh, or people who think I worked hard for my money, which is why I'm entitled to $200 billion, uh, you know, in Jeff Bezos' exactly. case or whatever, right? Uh, but, you know, the, the property owning democracy thing, just to get back, uh, yeah, again, yeah, yeah. he seems to say that, again, most of the means of production would be managed uh, democratically. It uh, doesn't get into a great deal um, on what that would entail. And he seems to sometimes think that this would be managed uh, by the state, right? Uh, I would push against that a little bit. And contend that actually what we need is more forms of workplace democracy that aren't quite as state oriented uh, as Rawls seems to think are as appropriate. And there need to be more management from the floor uh, because people who live and work in these kind of local particularities uh, will have a better insight uh, as to how things should be managed than a state. Exactly. Vote, yeah. Right. I got to say, this sounds a lot like the, you know, nominally Marxist economist Richard Wolff. Right. Who says uh, his main argument really is workplace democracy. Like he's not even calling for some sort of state owned or state-run communism, he just says, and he calls himself a Marxist, uh, 
And his main argument sounds a lot like this, which is just that bring democracy to the workplaces and, and uh, since, the, oh, since the, the employees should have a stake. But there would still be corporations. They would just be more like co-ops and they would be competing against each other in the marketplace. It's just that everybody who works there would actually have a stake in the decision. So it'd be more democratic. And by his uh, reasoning, he thinks it would be more just. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, and the argument he makes is that, you know, in a property only democracy, uh, they'll still be competitive firms. Right. You know, they'll be encouraged to compete with one another, produce goods and they'll kind of rise and fall uh, based on whether consumers are willing to buy their products. You know, it's not people are going to be told, you know, this is what's available and you have to get it. But all this we've managed uh, by the demos rather than by private actors or corporate actors. Right. The argument right. for liberal socialism uh, is also equally vague, um, but it seems to be a contention that things would go even further than a property owning democracy. Right. Uh, there would still be a political democracy in place, different competing parties. Uh, people would still be permitted to enjoy all the standard liberal, liberal rights. But private property and power would be even more distributed than it would uh, in a workplace democracy, particularly at a more local level, uh, to ensure that there'd be no recalcification uh, of power and authority uh, in any private hands. And resources and goods uh, would be redistributed not just through the industrial uh, or the work sector, uh, but probably also by the state to make sure that everybody, particularly the least well off, was entitled to a very high standard of living. Uh, and right. the only inequalities that would be permitted, again, uh, would be those subject to a very strict expectation that they work to the benefit of those at the very bottom. Right. Right. And I like, yeah. And I, sometimes when I think about the difference principle, I often think about uh, how, like I imagine, I don't think that I'm sure this isn't actually how it would probably work, but I remember like, you know, when I was first learning about Rawls in undergrad, I remember kind of like imagining this court, like a Supreme court that would somehow have these tools or like these legal tests to see whether or not um, these inequalities, like let's say a corporation, a, a co-op or something ends up having all this money in the bank and it's just sitting there. And then you'd have like something, some sort of like, I don't know, financial, like forensic financial investigator look and be like, okay, like, is this money benefiting the war stuff? I mean, maybe that's not how it works, but I remember that's kind of how I would imagine it working, which kind of like cracked me up, seemed like a bit impractical, but also like interesting to imagine. And of course, I mean, it makes you think about all the money that corporations have that are just sitting there doing stock buybacks. And, you know, to, to some extent, they're really not benefiting uh, society or certainly not the worst, the, the worst off. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, I mean, if you think about somebody like um, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, right, uh, and their contention now that uh, I think it was Elon Musk who said this, right, you know, I have, they have so much money right now that the only thing they could possibly spend it on would be space travel. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, you know, a, a, a strict defender of the market might say, well, you know, if they decide to build rocket ships and go to Mar uh, go to Mars, uh, that'll generate jobs. It might generate new technologies. It will improve tech uh, people's quality of life overall. Uh, I don't think Rawls would argue against that. Right. Again, uh, Rawls recognized that there are certain situations where inequalities can benefit the least well off versus by rewarding people who are innovative uh, and create technologies that help the poor. But he would say, you know, if you think about the kind of gross disparity between those kind of lavish displays of wealth and the minimal benefits they accrue uh, with what you could do with $40 billion, $60 billion or whatever to benefit the poorest people in your society, let alone the world, right? There's another question about whether these kind of principles could apply nationally, right? Uh, right. It seems very clear that this is very far from a just set of uh, organization. Because uh, you think about, you know, billions of dollars, you know, that could provide tens of thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people with a dignified life uh, for the rest yeah. of the days, not to mention you could establish institutions that would benefit the future generations, uh, for instance, by providing a higher quality education, better maternal care, you name it, right? Yeah, I could, I, I could imagine under this view, like uh, maybe a, a pretty generous basic income, right, would be like a, maybe be part of like a socialist uh, liberalism or whatever. It's possible, right? Again, he doesn't really talk a lot about yeah. how this is to be uh, carried out or implemented, right? Uh, which is an unfortunate defect in his work. You know, Rawls was a political theorist in the most capital P, capital T sense of the word, right? Yeah. Uh, aside from a tour of duty during the Second World War, uh, where he lost his religious faith, it's quite an interesting story. Uh, he spent his life in oh, yeah. academic analytical philosophy. Large parts of his work are technical, responding uh, to debates that a lot of people probably wouldn't find all that interesting. Uh, frankly, even strict Rawlsians usually don't find them all that interesting, right? But I, I think the central animating idea that the people that we have an obligation to are the least among us, right? And that our society spends way too much time catering um, really to the people at the top, 
right? And venerating them and praising them for activities for which they can claim no real credit. Uh, that's the kind of moral force of his objection. Uh, and I think it's become even more pertinent in the 21st century as people like the IDW, who you've written about really gracefully, uh, try to make mm-hmm. all these kind of arguments for competence hierarchies uh, or oh, yeah. veering the people who have high IQs just because and all the innovations that they bring and so on and so forth. You know, Rawls would sit there and have nothing but, not scorn, because he was a particularly scornful guy, <laughs> uh, but he'd yeah. have nothing but bad things to say about the kind of artifice that's required to hold on to these kind of ideologically vacuous viewpoints. Yeah, totally. I, um, you know, it's funny. I mean, I, I know that Rawls is certainly a Kantian in a lot of senses, but I think uh, what's interesting, and there's been a few books that have been written about this that actually trace him as being quite influenced by Hegel that I think a lot of people don't don't really realize. And I think like maybe where that comes through, right, is when he talks about things like the social basis of self-respect as being like a necessary condition of justice. So what he means by that is just like, uh, so there's these things that that he refers to as um, primary goods, mm-hmm. which are kind of like the things that need to be distributed. That's the thing that we're calculating, like what needs to be distributed on, in order for justice to obtain. And he talks about how the social basis of self-respect is sort of like something that the state is going to instill or like the society, the, the, the regime. Um, and I think he has like interesting things to say about um, – when he's talking about the social basis of self-respect, like sort of the consciousness of citizens, like it's kind of underemphasized, but he does talk a lot about, you know, that people will feel um, when they see that the rules are fair, right, they're going to become like and somehow better citizens. There's a kind of like moral perfectionism. And I think it, in, in any case, whether it's a Galey or not, I think it's interesting that there's a kind of underlying civic uh, virtue in, in Rawls that is often not very emphasized where he talks about like citizenship and participation. And they're like, there, there'll be some sort of psychological impact on citizens. I'm not sure if I find this necessarily convincing when they see that the rules are fair, they'll be better citizens in a way. And I'm not sure if you had thoughts about that. Yeah, no, I think he actually writes a great deal about this. Uh, In fact, you can make a pretty strong argument that his second major book, political liberalism, uh, along with a lot of the other affiliated papers, uh, deals with this almost exclusively uh, over several hundred right. pages, right? Uh, and this is a response to a variety of different criticisms of a theory of justice, uh, particularly people like people like Michael Sandel uh, in his book Liberalism yeah. and the Liberal Limits of Justice, uh, where these figures argue that, well, Rawls is kind of repeating the Kantian problem, right, uh, of viewing people as atomized individuals, in this case who are purely self-interested, uh, who are trying to will moral rules, uh, in this case the principles of justice, from this kind of removed standpoint. And we don't like that, and we think that it's subject to all the kind of problems that befell Kant's philosophy, uh, and as you pointed out, that Hegel in particular criticized very effectively. And I don't think that that's an accusation you can level against Rawls, at least not to the same degree you can level uh, level it against Kant, right? Totally, Um, yeah. And this is one of the things he points out, right? That the last third of a theory of justice took up the question of what it's like to live in a a political society uh, and what the good, as he calls it, of justice would be in association with other people. Uh, But political liberalism really makes the argument that you're talking about, uh, which is that over time, if people regard their society as fair and as operating uh, according to a reasonable conception of justice, then they're going to regard it as a cooperative association to the benefit of all, rather than just one where they simply live or inhabit what he calls a modus vivendi, yeah. which I think is an interesting claim, because uh, a modus vivendi uh, is in some senses the kind of old Marxist um, argument about living in an ideological, uh, living in a society where there's an ideological superstructure rewritten in the late yeah. 20th century. Because uh, a modus vivendi is a situation where uh, you recognize that you are alienated from the society in which you live, you, there's a state apparatus in place uh, to prevent you from questioning it too strictly, uh, let alone from rising up and trying to change it. And you may well resent this, uh, or you may think that things need to be changed, but ultimately and there's nothing that you're going to be able to do because you think that the cost uh, of trying to establish a more just society will simply be too high, right? Yeah. Uh, and Rawls' argument is that liberal society as it exists right now, particularly uh, the USA at the turn of the 20th century, is very much just in modus, uh, does uh, just have a lot of people who live according to a more mere modus vivendi, right? Yes. People feel yes. really dissatisfied with the society they live in. They want it to change. Uh, they feel that it's unjust and that it's not a cooperative association for the benefit of all, uh, that it's to the benefit primarily of the 1%. Uh, 
And I think those problems he was describing are much worse now. <laughs> like, I mean, I think people feel what he was describing at the turn of the 20th century much more acutely now. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. I mean, we have a bill- there's a billionaire reality TV star as a president, right? Uh, just exactly. Enacted, massive tax cuts uh, to all of his buddies. Uh, I mean, can't blame him for COVID, right? But, you know, we're, sure. we're bearing the dark fruit of that now uh, when, you know, there's millions of people who are starving and have lost their jobs and there just isn't any money to support them, right? Exactly. But, you know, Rawls' argument is, you know, we, should, we can do better and we should do better. And if we do do better, uh, then eventually people in a very Hegelian vein, right, will start to yeah. associate themselves with the principles of justice within their society. Exactly. They'll develop what he calls an overlapping consensus uh, that this is the kind of society uh, or cooperative association they would want to live in. Uh, and what he means by an overlapping consensus is that you might uh, be a religious person uh, who believes in say, a Catholic uh, view of the good and the right. I might be an agnostic. But both of us will look at our society and say, you know what, this is a just society. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean that everybody within the society is just or that bad things don't happen uh, since individuals, of course, still make bad and malicious choices. Right. Uh, You won't get rid of the Hannibal Lecter's of the world or whatever. Right. Uh, Yeah. But the principles of justice animating it are good. Yeah. Sometimes I've thought about this as kind of like there's there's those trust in government polls. Right. And I think to some extent this would be like a very magnified into like um kind of um, um, emotional feeling towards the, the the state or the society that you feel a great deal of trust right and of course the highest trust societies are like the Scandinavian ones and I think mm-hmm. maybe what he's imagining is like you know this even higher level of trust where people kind of like oh yeah like I trust the society I feel like I, I'm getting what I need and then they can go about their their business in other ways maybe it's not so much that they'd be necessarily like um uh like love and uh like their their um the principles of justice in this like deep way, but they would just like trust. And that's like, at least how I've thought about it. I don't know. No, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, Rawls uh, draws this distinction between the right and the good. That's pretty common to liberal theory generally, right? And there's a lot of criticisms right. you can make of it, and we won't get into that here, right? But his argument is that the benefit of liberalism uh, and of the kind of egalitarian liberalism he's arguing for is everyone would have the resources and the freedom and the social self-respect at the very least to pursue a vision of a good, a good life that they felt was appropriate to them. Exactly. Right? And his argument isn't that, well, under these conditions, everyone will ultimately achieve the good life that's appropriate to them. Since part and part, that's an individual quest, right? If your goal is to find spiritual solace in, you know, the arms of God, uh, or, you know, to <clears throat> liberate yourself from the cycle of samsara or whatever it happens to be, well, politics is probably not that much of a guide for you. Right. Uh, yeah. In some sense, you're engaging in a quest that's independent uh, of the things that political philosophy or politics generally can deal with. Right. Uh, but certainly we can enable you and empower you in that quest. Uh, and under those conditions, you'll be able to pursue it far more effectively in tandem with other people, if that's what you wish. And yeah. Yeah. You can all benefit. And I think this is a Millsian point. Right. Uh, if you are successful in your pursuit of the good life, uh, because we can learn uh, from the achievements and the failures that accrue over the pursuit of this endeavor. Good. Yeah. So before I know you, you've got limited time. So I, so I do kind of want to get to this last point, which is um, I want to bring up like the ways in which this is different from like a Marxist. And now, because I think that, you know, given that the, this podcast is more of a, a critical theory oriented and, you know, we often get accused by our uh, compatriots on the podcast as being liberal cucks, you know, I think that it's, you know, it would be, maybe important to to draw some sort of lines and be like, in what ways would we be, would people who have maybe more Marxist or critical theory bent, uh, where would they see that we're going wrong or, or, um, or see a big difference? Well, I think that there are two things to say about that, right? Uh, one is that Marxism, at least in its classical formulation, uh, particularly as articulated, I'd say, by Engels rather than Marx, uh, is presented as a descriptive uh, theory of how it is that society operates, right? Uh, and... In principle, it doesn't make moral or normative evaluations of that society. Uh, it says that these are the kind of norms or mores appropriate to a given epoch in history, uh, the liberal capitalist epoch. Uh, but we claim that the imminent contradictions inherent within it are going to bring it down uh, and it'll be replaced by a communist society. Right. Uh, and Rawls doesn't reason that way. Right. It's not that he's indifferent to history. Uh, it's just that he says there is a place for moral critique, purely moral critique. Right. Uh, And I think he is right about that. Right. Uh, And I think actually, for that matter, that if you look deeply enough in the works of Marx, uh, it's very clear that he also has moral criticisms 
of capitalism, although in his later works, they're not often presented that way, uh, particularly in the kind of arguments, very young Hegelian arguments about how under capital, uh, our species being is mutilated uh, and we're not able to realize all sides of our personality uh, as self-determining beings, right? Uh, I think it's hard not to look at that as a moral critique, right? Yes, uh, totally. Rawls does something, makes a similar claim, right? Uh, except his argument is that there's a different way uh, of formulating that. Uh, and that's by trying to theorize about what the best principles governing society would be, uh, and then to check the society you live in against uh, that society. Uh, and I think, right. you know, some Marxists can criticize that, well, ideas don't turn the world around, economic relations do, right? Uh, this is the kind of comment about the thesis on Furback. Uh, but I think, you know, Marx is probably just wrong about that. There is a place where ideas can resonate and can make a difference uh, and move people forward. Uh, and I right. think Rawls' arguments have done as much to contribute to that task uh, as anyone. Uh, the thing where I think Marx comes out better than Rawls uh, at uh, is in his critique uh, of the actual conditions um, right. of liberal <clears throat> capitalist society. Uh, again, you know, Rawls was a political theorist, capital P, capital T, uh, you know, he's leveling a moral critique of society. He doesn't spend a lot of time analyzing actual material conditions, doesn't really spend any time looking at history, has very little to say uh, about the twos and fro's of even conventional day-to-day -day politics in his day. I think he made something like one or two public uh, contributions uh, weighing in on Supreme Court issues and so on uh, throughout the course of his life. Right. Uh, and so if you're looking for Rawls uh, to give you a picture um, of what's described about of how your society operates, the power dynamics within it, uh, where points not a good source. Yeah. Are, yeah, you're not going to find it there. Right. Um, Agreed. And, you know, I, I think he would say, well, that's not what I'm trying to do. Uh, but sometimes that produces deficiencies in his work. And, you know, you and I have talked about this before. Right. Uh, yeah. For instance, I think one of the deficiencies in his work uh, is precisely on this point of workplace democracy. Right. Uh, Rawls kind of takes a very statist approach to things at points, uh, even when arguing for property only democracy uh, or liberal socialism. Uh, and he doesn't have a lot to say about workers' movements, for example. I think, though, that workers' movements are vital if you're even going to preserve property only democracy uh, or liberal socialism, uh, because if everything's oriented by the state, that gives capital too much leeway uh, to kind of try to seize control uh, of the state apparatus uh, and re entrench its power, right? You need to right. build base level institutions that are sufficiently powerful enough to maintain commitments to the principles of justice over time uh, and make them right. stable. And Rawls does talk about this a little bit, but not nearly as much as you should, right? And I, and I guess if, and, and the, yeah, for sure. And I guess if we had more time, you know, I would want to bring up, um, what's his name, G.A. Cohen, right? And yeah, say yeah. that there's also this difference about, uh, about like the, the forms of equality, inequality that we allow in a society. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's kind of a weird Marxist because he's an analytic Marxist. So yeah. I don't even know if other Marxists would necessarily agree with him or not. But I guess maybe we can maybe we can talk about that another time. Yeah, and this is where I actually think uh, maybe it's a good place to end. Actually, Rawls's principles yeah. can even be more radical uh, than certain moral interpretations of Marx's doctrine, uh, right? Because Cohen's moral argument uh, is essentially that people are exploited, right? Uh, the workers produce most of the goods in society through their labor that's appropriated by the capitalist class and then sold for a profit. Uh, and this is wrong because they, in a certain sense, are really entitled uh, to the goods that they produce. And this is a pretty forceful moral objection. The problem is, uh, you know, there, it's pretty close uh, to the arguments of bourgeois political economy, uh, which just inverts this relation and says that, well, the capitalists are actually the ones that produce most of the value. Uh, and so therefore, right. they're the ones that should get most of the profit, right? Uh, Rawls' right. argument is in some <clears throat> cases more radical, I think, uh, and a lot of people reject me saying this, but, but it's because he says this is all – a matter of indifference. It doesn't matter who produces the value in society right. uh, because say you're able-bodied and you're able to work. Well, not everyone's able to do that. Some people have disabilities or some people are denied this because of misogynistic or patriarchal institutions. Right. right? It doesn't matter how hard you worked because if you are able to work hard, that's probably uh, the result of circumstances for which you can claim no credit. Right. Uh, so all this stuff about labor is secondary to the fact that what we should be doing is working to the benefit of the least well off uh, because and making yeah yeah and making focusing that, on fairness yeah it's focusing on fairness uh, because any argument about labor is always going to imply that it's okay for some people to have a lot more uh, even an immense amount more if they work harder right right uh, no that makes a lot of sense yeah and Wall says it doesn't matter if you work a hundred hours and someone works twenty hours right if that person can't work can only work twenty hours because they have a disability and you work a hundred hours you still have to help them right. 
Yeah, uh, right. And I, I don't think this objection flies against Cla Marx himself, uh, but it does fly pretty staunchly against the kind of moral Marxism that you see articulated by people like Cohen, um, right. which is vulnerable to a lot of the libertarian objections raised by people like Nozick and so on. Okay. All right. Awesome. Awesome. That was that was that was really interesting. I hope uh, the the listeners got something from that. I know Rawls can sometimes not be the most interesting to people who are more uh, emphasize the critical theory or historical approach to philosophy, but uh, yeah. we certainly think Rawls is an important figure. So thanks everyone for listening. Yeah. And I should say uh, his books are pretty dry and technical and often really boring. If you ever decide to get it, to go through it, uh, I applaud you because there's a ton of stuff to learn there, but no one's going to give him writer of the year award. Um, it takes so. a long time, but like once you get into a system, I actually started to find it fun, but it takes a lot of time. It does. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Thanks. Thanks.